Hey, I'm Gabriel, also known as Gabo the Guy. I'm passionate about traveling and taking people on amazing adventures. I'm on a journey to discover northern Portugal and experience the region's unique culture, gastronomy, and beautiful landscape. Let's visit Porto on the North. Portugal's northern region is rich in heritage and history, so I'm visiting some of its most impressive sites. I start by visiting a cluster of three major historical and holy places, the Tarouca and the Salzedas monasteries and the sanctuary of Lamego. I then make a stop in the Douro wine region to get a history lesson in winemaking throughout the centuries at Quinta Nova. Moving east, time to visit the Coa Museum the largest open-air Paleolithic art gallery in the world. I continue on to Freixo de Espada Cinta to learn about silk production before ending my journey in the city of Braganza, home to a perfectly preserved 13th century Gothic castle. I came to São João do Toroca, a place where religion, tradition and archaeology gathered to tell the wonderful story of a small group of monks that came to build the first monastery in Portugal. I called my savvy tour guide, Monica Nogueira, to, Hello, Gabriel. to bring this place back to life. Thank you so much for the invitation. So look at this building. This is a very simple facade, but I hope that you will see how different this is inside. So it's a very unique building that we have. Now I'm intrigued. You can see all of this golden decoration. This is an 18th century style, the Baroque. Everything it was made with wood and then it was painted with real gold. We have here a unique piece, which is the Cadeirao, the seats. And this is unique because it's exactly on the main part of this church. You can see also the pipe organ. It was what we used to call the Iberian style because we have the pipes vertical. I can see this place was an important junction for the religious clergy. Yes, it was. It was important also for all the community and now we understand how big this place was. Wow. And you can see that we don't have only the Talha Dourada, this golden work, but we have also the Azuejo. Do you know what is an Azuejo? The famous Portuguese tile? Exactly. So here we have those ones here because they are closer to the main altar, they represent some religious scenes. But I'm sure that you notice when we entrance that we had also some tiles and they were more like a tapestry. And now if you don't mind, I'd like to show you a different type of ties that we have at the sacristy. You know me too well, Monica. Here we go. Can you see here? All of those ties, they were hand-painted. How hard it was what to do it. Yeah. But before they did it like this, they have to learn. <laughs> so look at the inside of this sacristy. As you can see here, those ones, they are different. It seems that they are a bit smaller. Yes, they are, and they have just one single painting in each one. You can see looking around. Mm -hmm. They represent mostly like uh, nature, some flowers, some birds, but some of them, they're also a little bit naughty. Can you see this one here? Mm, Quite unique see. to have it in a sacristy. But the idea was woman. Exactly. The idea was just to represent some of the neighbors, some of the close friends, or sometimes even the student's face or some family relative members face as well. So I'm guessing this is the Mona Lisa of San Joao de Toroca. I just love it. It's <laughs> nice to say that way. Let's go find Da Vinci. <laughs> the Salzedas Monastery was built around the 12th century and belongs to the order of Cistercians. The building has been subject to several reconstructions throughout the ages, giving it a unique architectural aesthetic. Within the monastery, there is a museum displaying sculptures, relics and religious art. Wow, this is real life history and architecture in the making right here. I could actually hear the masons working, putting the tiles in place, chiseling the bricks, and eventually at the end of the day, 
they would come and sign their name. And you can see this cross right here that identifies the Mason. So eventually at the end of the day, he could get paid. Throughout the centuries, this region has been chosen by different peoples to establish and live here, each one living testaments of their culture behind. This is one of the oldest human settlements in northern Portugal. It is around this abbey that Lusitanians, Romans, and later on Visigoths and Muslims built their own villages. My next stop is the city of Lamego. Here we are back at the top of the hill of the city of Lamego just beneath the beautiful church of St. Mary of the Remedy. I'm back here with my savvy guide, Monica. And Moni, I understand this was an important stop at the pilgrimage to the north of Portugal? Yes, it was. You can see that so we are a little bit far away from the center of Flamengo. We have 686 steps coming up here, and it was a pilgrimage place. There was, by tradition, many of the pilgrims doing all the way by knees. Can you imagine the sacrifice to arrive up here? But in fact, it was a beautiful place. Look at the park around, look at the fountains, look at the statues. Even today, this is inviting people for coming and to enjoy the place. It is very peaceful here indeed. Should we check out the 686 steps? I'm counting on you. <laughs> Cheerio! Directly across the sanctuary, there is the cathedral and the museum of Lamego, references of knowledge and art in the city. I've arranged to meet with Eduardo, a wine expert at Quinta Nova. He knows all about this region and the way they've produced wine here for centuries. Seeing this landscape filled with terraces and barren hills makes me wonder, how did they create these terraces? Makes me more curious. And I think Eduardo could shed some light about this interesting way of cultivation. Okay, Gabriel, welcome to Quinta Nova. Thank you. It was an incredible journey here, Eduardo. Yeah, very nice spot here in Douro Valley. Uh, Quinta Nova, one of the oldest from this region, more than 250 years. Wow. Yeah. Legacy in the make. A legacy with 500 artifacts that we have here to show the ancient way that we used to use to do our famous port wine. Sounds fascinating. Let's do it. This is the first point that you can see and uh, show us a lady doing the, the job of the cutting uh, process, the harvest itself. Our grandfather used to say that the ladies have a more gentle hands to do the job, because for the men it was reserved another way that you can see. Now you can see the very hard job doing by those guys. Uh, for sure that we don't use this anymore, but you can imagine for uh, centuries that they use those big baskets with the weight between 60 75 kilos. Wow, it seems heavy. You can imagine all day with it, it's extremely hot. And through the top the, terraces to exactly, the Exactly, you can imagine those hills very steep. Uh, you can see what they use on his head to support the weight of those big baskets, here on top of his neck. Like a belt to exactly. reduce the weight yeah, from And one not one. only, to balance much better. Mm, you can see. already saw those uh, very steep hills, so they need that to, to balance much better. The little stick to up to walk, not only for that, with these little things, can, can. things like that, oh, and balance. All day with this, extremely hot, very hard job. I and see. then you can see different uh, ancient tools, some we still use. This is an ancient tool that they use, a crash and the stammer, uh, the, the, the machine that they use, what they put the grapes, everything on top, and look, they will roll this, will crash, will smash everything, and then everything will fall to sometimes in the big tanks on those that we call lagars. For sure, the most important step to do the fortification of the port wine, the lab, mm -hmm. an authentic chemical lab, as you can see. As man interferes in the process exactly, of fermentation. Exactly. Because in fact, it's a fortification of the port wine that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Several ancient tools uh, where they were able to make some measures, the alcohol level, the sugar level, the pH, you name it. You can see here uh, how they work uh, the oak 
for the port wine. Because remember, when we are talking about the oak for table wine, dry steel wine, as you want to name it, we use the, the, the oak barrels uh, five cycles. But for port a lifetime. After we wash them with a piece of chalk, we will mark and we'll number the wood from the clockwise, number one, number two, number three. And then they will disassemble everything. And look, go everything to the old tool, muleta. They put here and then they will get and remove all that glue out, clean everything, put everything together and reuse. Eduardo, you left me curious with this chapel. Could you take me there? Yeah, sure. So the little chapel, we go down to the river now when we go and you'll see an awesome Let's hit the road. Awesome little chapel. Very good lunch, very awesome wines and all those the landscape. That's the recipe for the good life. Yeah, exactly. So now we're walking the original stairs. Exactly. You can see, how, you can imagine how difficult it will, it will be carrying those big baskets through those steps, Incredible. so high, so tiny thing, but it's always been like that. So this is the only means of passing through exactly. one terrace so, to the other. Exactly, those stairs. Not an easy life. Not an easy life. Very difficult times that they have to pass that river. And it was here that the people come together. They took the, their hat and praying in front of the little chapel, asking, like I told you, the protection to do all that journey from here until uh, Porto City. You can imagine 150 kilometers with a very different uh, river that we can see now, very strong, dangerous, very strong, very, with too many rapids. In fact, a very difficult river at the time. Eduardo, thank you for such an educational and inspirational tour. I've learned so much. I think it's time for me to experience and pay tribute to those brave sailors and navigate on the Rio River Duro myself. Thank you for coming and a nice trip and a safe one. Thank you. You're welcome. I travel northeast along the beautiful banks of the Douro River to reach another valley. Valle du Coa. In order to understand the religions and traditions of northern Portugal, one must understand history. And what is history if not his story? And when does his story begin once he took the time to write it down? Here in the Museum of Ducoa, they tell the story of the first expression of man engraved in the bedrock. Hello, Gabriel. Hi, Dalila. Bem-vindo ao Museu Ducoa. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. O Museu Ducoa é o maior sítio do mundo da arte paleolítica ao ar livre e, e mostra o que somos nós, a humanidade, desde há 25 mil anos até aos dias de hoje. A arte paleolítica reflete a sociedade de caçadores e recoletores que viviam neste território e pela primeira vez na humanidade fomos capazes de reproduzir o que chamamos hoje em dia de arte. E esse grande ciclo artístico do COA mostra o quão importante foi este território durante 25 mil anos. E o que eu tenho aqui? Eu posso checar os petroglifos eles Bom, isto são pequenas placas originais que foram retiradas do sítio do Fariseu, aqui no Val do Coa, e neste caso é um veado representado com uma serva com um pescoço esticado. E aqui podes ver um original gravado há 14 mil anos por um artista que quis deixar impressa na rocha uma representação com esta qualidade artística. Nós temos neste momento mais de 80 sítios com arte no Coa, mas só três é que estão abertos ao público, onde os visitantes são acompanhados com guias uh, que fazem toda a explicação, toda a contextualização do que era este homem e como vivia no Paleolítico Superior. E as visitas são organizadas em viaturas todo terreno, que podem depois usufruir também de uma paisagem absolutamente incrível e quase intocada pelo homem. Do Paleolítico Superior até aos nossos dias, os nossos antepassados traçaram uma linha de comunicação que dormia silenciosa nas margens do povo. The nearby village of Freixo de Espada Cinta is home to the Museum of Silk 
and of the territory. Inside, you'll find zoomorphic sculptures dating back to the Iron Age, particularly common in this region. There are also tools representing the main labor activities in the territory throughout the centuries, and the piece de resistance, an introduction to the world of silk. So Gabriel, this is the life cycle of the silk worm. We, since the egg, the worm itself, to the formation of the cocoon, yes, and then the butterfly. And if you want to really know what will happen after this process, come along, I'll show you something special. Let's do it. In 2016, the Golden Cocoon Association was born with the mission to defend, preserve, and recreate the entire silk production process, from the creation of the silkworm, through extraction and spinning to weaving. The artisan silk weavers that work here help keep this ancient craft alive, brought to this village by Jewish settlers in the 15th century. Here I arrived to the house of the famous poet Gera Junqueiro, the poet of the people and the man that inspired the first Republican to rebel against the kings and the monarchy and establish the first Portuguese Republic. Let's go in and find out what's his story. As you can see, the fascinating doors of the village did not skip the poet of the people's house. There is a fascinating story be hiding behind it. This was actually the entrance to the house itself where the people used to live, mainly on the upper floor. But over here would be the entrance to their workshop or their specific shop. And this village of artisans and craftsmanship was slowly establishing itself as a prime location of silk production, craftsmanship, and art. An ancient tradition that is still told here in the village talks about the new Christians, the Maranos, that used to come here after the expulsion of Spain, and there was a small community living in the city. Each of them is known to shape the entrance door to his house, these rocks, in this funny looking angle that is a part of the architecture of the time. But the tradition says that they used to recognize each other's house walking through this short alley here in the darkness by touching the cornerstone of each house. So then they would know this would be a safe house for them. As I roam the streets of the village, I discover more and more secrets hidden in the rocks. So it was in this place where the religions of Judaism and Christianity met and the process of syncretism began. The year is 1492, the Jews are expelled from Spain and they march on as they start their journey into the safe lands of Portugal. After crossing the border, they arrive here to this village of Freixo da Espada Asinta, and it was in this area where they were able to settle down and begin a new life. Through the picturesque northern interior, I make my way to the last stop of my historic journey to discover the beautiful heart-shaped castle of Braganza. Today I'm in Braganza, the city behind the mountains. The north gave birth to the first and last family dynasties that ruled the Portuguese kingdom. Although the capital slowly moved down south from Guimarães to Coimbra, eventually ending up in Lisbon, don't be confused the North remembers. Here at the castle of Braganza, there's a lot going on. As you can see, I'm walking on the city walls, but this place might look very ancient, but to me, it's the peak of modern life here in northern Portugal. How come? There are medieval fairs going on in the heart of the castle. There are very, very traditional, yet very modern cuisine and sizzling taverns and pubs in the heart of this old city. And if that's not enough, one can go on and hike through the mountains of the region, grab a horse and go through a horseback riding, or even hop on a jeep 
and go on a 4x4 Jeep ride. If you think of coming to the north of Portugal, do not miss the Castle of Braganza. Following the trails left here by distant cultures, we can enjoy the journey as we write our own story in northern Portugal.